I'm not the type of person who wants to see everything fall apart when something goes wrong. When I noticed things weren't right with my wife, I didn't hesitate to talk to her about it. I asked her why she had stopped talking to me, hugging me, and being close. I even asked her why she seemed uncomfortable with my touch. It wasn't easy to get her to open up at first, but eventually, she did. What she said broke my heart. She told me she didn't feel like I was enough for her. She felt like she had to do everything herself and couldn't rely on me. She said she had to make all the decisions and handle everything, including the kids. She even went as far as saying that maybe she would be better off alone. Hearing all this was a shock, but I didn't want to fight. I love her so much that I accepted what she said and told her I understood her pain. I promised her I would work on my behavior so she wouldn't have to stress. I just want to make things right because she means the world to me, but it's tough. Despite all that, I still have my own thoughts that keep me awake at night. That's actually why I ended up seeking support from this group. The accusations my wife is making against me just aren't true, at least not from my perspective. I genuinely believe I'm a good husband who meets the norm. I work around 8 or 9 hours from home, and when I'm finished, I dedicate myself to taking care of my boys. I play with them, feed them, take the older one to swim lessons, and tuck them in at bedtime. I'll even wake up in the middle of the night if they need me. It's not just about the kids. I also handle household chores, the dishes, groceries, and some cleaning, although my wife thinks I'm not efficient enough at it, so she prefers to take over. I also take care of the car and other responsibilities related to our new house. I do all of this to make her life easier because I know how challenging it can be with two little boys. But the thing is, I'm not always the type of person who's constantly proactive. There are those people who can't sit on the couch for five minutes without thinking about what needs fixing or what chores are left to do. My father-in-law is like that, but I'm not. I have my own unique way of doing things, and I believe that's okay too. At the end of the day, when the kids are asleep, work is checked off, and the house is in order, I look forward to unwinding with a movie or some video games. I've never been the entrepreneurial type who dreams of starting a business. I thrive when I'm given tasks to excel at, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Plenty of people are like me. I'm not chasing a flashy career or dreaming of swimming in money. I'm just an ordinary guy. But lately, things have been different. I've noticed my wife having issues with my approach even though we've had nine years of blissful marriage. It all came to a head in December, and since then, I've been pushing myself to go against my natural personality. I've been doing extra groceries, fixing things around the house, and barely taking a moment to rest in the evenings. I thought she'd appreciate it, but her attitude toward me remained unchanged. I mustered up the courage to confront her, my emotions running high. I looked her straight in the eye and asked her point blank. Do you even want to save our marriage? Her response at me like a ton of bricks. I don't know. I couldn't believe it. Was she that clueless or just indifferent? I gritted my teeth and pushed on, asking her if she was willing to go to marriage counseling. And once again, she gave the same infuriating answer. I don't know. I couldn't take it anymore. I snapped, telling her that this was not the time for indecision. Our kids could end up with divorced parents if we didn't act fast and her lack of commitment was unacceptable. She finally agreed to go to therapy after much prodding, but she showed no interest in taking any initiative. I had to do all the legwork in finding a therapist myself. During one of our counseling sessions, she dropped brutal truths that cut me to the core. She said she only married me to impress her family and fit into their idea of a perfect, happy family with beautiful children. She admitted that she was never truly in love with me, but was merely enchanted by the idea of marriage. As if that wasn't enough, I later found out she had met with a priest to discuss our marriage behind my back. It felt like a betrayal, leaving me reeling with anger and hurt. But despite it all, I soldiered on and found a good therapist for us. We're now approaching our third session, but it's been a rocky road. We've learned that we have different love languages. I crave touch while she prioritizes getting things done. It's been a constant struggle. To make matters worse, she hasn't shown me any physical affection since we started counseling. No hugs, no touch, nothing. The therapist was taken aback when she learned that my wife and I hadn't slept in the same room for six months. My wife tried to explain it away by saying she's been sharing the bed with the kids, and there's simply no space for me. But the therapist didn't hold back. 
She bluntly told my wife that it's a terrible example to set for the kids, denying their own father access to the bedroom. She even suggested we should buy a single bed to put next to the big one. I went ahead and did just that. I bought the bed, assembled it, and now I sleep there. But I still feel just as alone as before. My wife is all the way to the left, the boys are in the middle, and I'm stuck on the far right feeling like an outsider in my own marriage. From the very beginning of this issue, my wife has been changing her story. Now she's saying she's depressed from being stuck at home with the kids all the time. She claims she said all those hurtful things because she was just too emotional. But I would never dream of saying anything like that to her, no matter how upset I am. So, my wife went back to work, and we hired a nanny to handle the kids. The only noticeable change is that we've started talking more. I'm not just her buddy. I'm her husband too, and there's zero closeness between us. It doesn't look like it's going to improve anytime soon. There are no signs of it. She doesn't seem to care about our marriage counseling sessions, and I'm the one who has to keep setting them up. Things are much worse than I thought. My buddies kept telling me, dude, your wife is totally cheating on you, but at first I thought that was like some sci-fi movie stuff. I didn't believe my wife would do that. Today, though, everything changed. I caught her red-handed. I had installed a voice-activated recorder in our car for just three days. She used the car to go to work and the gym, and bam, she called him, or he called her twice. I heard every word of their video conversation on the phone and got all the evidence I needed. They were talking about personal stuff like when my wife and I first met nine years ago. You know, all those attractions, inside jokes, and stuff I haven't felt with her in a long time. Believe it or not, they were planning a vacation together, and she even wants to visit him in July, giving him two years to move back to our country. I can't wrap my head around it. They were even discussing intimate details, and she straight up said she's leaving me to be with him. They talked about their favorite positions, so you know they were real close. I listened to an hour-long recording of it all, and now I need to process it. I'm meeting with an attorney next week, thanks to a friend's suggestion. I wouldn't have bought that voice recording device if it wasn't for him. Someone might call me out for placing the recorder in the car, but I don't care. I don't feel guilty. I can't stop thinking about my kids and what she's done. They've been up to something since last September, and it took me two months to notice the changes in her behavior. Next week, I'll be taking care of my old father in another city for the entire week, so she'll be using my home office. She'll probably be talking to him in my office. Should I place the recorder there for the next week? Or do I already have enough evidence? Out of the blue, my wife tried calling her ex-boyfriend four times in a row at 10 p.m. I found out through an app that saved all our numbers and showed the incoming and outgoing calls. Why would my wife, who has never mentioned her ex before, suddenly be calling him persistently? It drove me insane. So, I checked her iMessages on her laptop. After calling him four times, she sent him a message saying, I'm not giving up until you actually answer and communicate with me in a respectful and civilized manner. I couldn't believe my eyes. I confronted her, and she denied everything until I showed her the evidence. She admitted to trying to reach her ex, but her story was convoluted. I'm uncertain about how to process all this. It all happened when she started distancing herself from me. Her perspective is that it's not strange or negative for her to have kept it from me, and it doesn't hold much significance to her. But to me, any contact with an ex is a red flag, and it's unacceptable. Our closeness has been lacking for the past six months, which is exactly when these calls took place. Who is her affair partner? Uppy. After all, I now have concrete evidence that our issues aren't due to the reasons she's been telling everyone. The thing is, she doesn't know that I know. None of her family or friends are aware either. They all think we're just going through a temporary rough patch. She comes from a Catholic family with three sisters and attends church every Sunday. We live in a small town with a population of 17,000. We recently built a house that's still unfinished. I discovered she's planning to have me leave so that she can have time alone. Within two years, her AP will move to our small town to live with her in our house, along with our two young boys. She's hoping people will understand, claiming she needs a father figure for the kids. Interestingly, the AP is actually her first boyfriend. They were together for seven years before she married me. We've been together for nine years. Although he lives abroad, he frequently visits our country. I won't let myself be manipulated that way. 
I've hired a lawyer, and we'll be meeting with him soon. I have recordings that could potentially damage her reputation. My cheating wife didn't see my next move coming. I talked to my lawyer and got to my opening advice. Going all out and trying to ruin her life during the divorce wouldn't be the wisest move. We have kids, and I'll be co-parenting with her for the next 15 to 16 years, so I need to be mindful of that. Plus, I respect her family and don't want to involve them in the divorce proceedings as witnesses. Additionally, I don't stand much chance of winning custody, as the kids need to be with their mother in the small town an hour away from me in the capital city. I wouldn't even be allowed to sell our house, because the kids need a decent place to live, and we don't have another option. The place they're staying at now is owned by her dad, so it's just a temporary arrangement. It sucks, but that's the reality in the Czech Republic, Europe. After our conversation, the lawyer sent her the divorce papers, set to be delivered right after Easter in the Czech Republic. Yesterday, I had a day off, so I took care of my one-year-old son while she worked in the capital city, about an hour away. Meanwhile, my brother helped me pack up my belongings from the apartment and load them into his car. To add to the chaos, the postman delivered the divorce papers, an invitation to mediation, so we could divide everything amicably. According to the papers, she's in a relationship with this guy, mentioning his first and last name, and that's apparently the reason for the divorce. At least the evidence I have will be useful for child support and such. It'll be leverage in my favor. When she walked into the house, I confronted her. I told her I knew everything and insisted she contact my lawyer. Then I handed her the divorce papers and left to visit her parents. Naturally, she asked how I knew and denied everything. Her parents were shocked, but they believed me. I recorded the entire conversation following my lawyer's advice. I asked if they thought I was a good husband and father, and they agreed, so they can't be used as witnesses against me in court. They understood the gravity of what she had done and how it devastated our lives. I thanked them for their understanding and headed to the capital city. Meanwhile, I reached out to a friend who helped spread the news to her circle of friends. Guess what? Two hours later, my brother-in-law called, saying she confessed to cheating with the affair partner, AP, but conveniently left out any mention of her closeness with him. Classic. He filled me in on how everyone's on my side and how she destroyed our once perfect family. He then suggested everything could be saved because he cheated on his wife too, and now they're living happily. Hilarious, right? Like that's gonna make me feel better. To add to the circus, her father called, blaming her and saying the AP will never set foot in his house again. He cut off financial support for my soon to be ex wife and tried calling the AP, but the guy didn't pick up. In a grand finale of absurdity, he thinks it can all be saved. But hold on, there's more. Her sister sent me a text saying she's fully on my side, yet believes the situation can be salvaged. It's good they're supporting me, but are they all delusional? It's ridiculous, as if this mess could be magically fixed. It's infuriating. I really don't think our relationship can be saved, and I'm quite certain about it. I worry others might think I lack concrete evidence for leaving her, since they aren't aware of the specifics. All they know is that I have some sort of tape. In reality, I've got recordings of her saying things like, make sure you can last longer than three seconds when I come to visit you in Brussels. And I'm curious if your dad's Johnson is as big as yours. Then there's, I'll ask that woman how long your brother's Johnson is and let her know how big yours is. And oh, I love you so much. Well, I'm finally going to leave my husband about time. She also said things like, record yourself and send me a video. I want to see what I'm missing. And just showing you a glimpse of what your sad life without me will look like, giving you a generous two years to figure out how to move back here. Crazy, right? So, guess who's calling back now? Yep, my ex. Just like all my friends predicted after her family gave her an earful. She's been texting me, confessing she had no clue what she was doing and that life would be unbearable without me. I'm so sorry for everything I've done. I'm waiting with the kids for your grand comeback. Blah, blah, blah. Meanwhile, my lawyer finally laid out the divorce terms, and now we're waiting for her lawyer's response. In the meantime, my mother-in-law flooded my phone with texts, complete with Christian links about forgiveness. She's convinced my wife's been possessed by some evil spirit. As if that wasn't enough drama, her sister jumped on the blame train telling me I'm the one ruining the marriage. According to her, it's all my fault for being selfish. But wait for it. 
Now my wife is teary and apologetic, wishing she could turn back time. Suddenly, I'm the selfish villain for wanting a divorce. For a moment, I felt guilty, like it's all my fault. They really know how to sway me. But you know what? It's tough, but I'm not changing my mind. The divorce is happening, no matter what. In the Czech Republic, kids as young as ours are expected to stay with their mother in case of a divorce. Since she lives an hour away in a small town and the kids have their kindergarten and nursery there, a 50-50 split isn't feasible. I'll be an every other weekend dad with some additional access whenever I want. It's sad and painful, but it is what it is. I've been thinking about an unusual idea, suggesting some terms to reconcile with her. I don't love her anymore, but I do it for the kids because I care about them a lot. It wouldn't be a marriage, more like a partnership with separate finances. She'd need to move from her hometown to the capital city where I live. I'd also insist on having GPS in her car, even when she's older and can't drive. I'd check her phone daily, and in return, I'd get to go on dates with other girls for seven months. I might even cheat during the relationship and not tell her. If she finds out whatever, no marriage anyway. I don't really care. It's just an idea. Nothing serious, and I probably won't go through with it. I'm just desperate to silence the family accusing me of abandoning the kids. What do you think? Crazy, right? But I don't have any other bright ideas. Currently, I'm crashing in my parents' place, sleeping on the living room couch. The dining table has become my makeshift office and entertainment center, and my clothes are scattered on chairs. I work from home for about eight hours a day, then pitch in with chores for my elderly parents who are 90 and 82 years old. I handle groceries and drive them to doctor appointments. Besides that, I try to hit the gym or catch a movie to distract myself from negative thoughts. I see my kids every weekend. My ex drops them off, and I drive them back. Just to clear things up, I did a paternity test confirming the boys are mine. The divorce situation is messy now, and it's tough to predict how it'll play out. I'm crashing in my parents' place, and as a dad of two and a grown adult, I have no other place to go. So. I'm asking for a decent amount of money from my wife. She's agreed to take over the mortgage for the house, but she's offering only a third of the money I'm asking for. She justifies it by saying that's my contribution to building the house. It's messy. I didn't cause this situation, but I need a place to live. Getting only a third of what I asked for won't be enough to buy a flat. The back and forth with our lawyers continues. She wants to keep the house, but she might be forced to sell it which is what she should have done from the beginning. It'll be tough for her to manage the mortgage payments and pay me. We'll see how it pans out for child support. She's asking for more than what's reasonable, and we need to come to an agreement on that. On top of that, she insists that I should be the one picking up the kids from her small town and driving them back at the end of the weekend. It's a lot of fuel and time on my part, and in my opinion, it should be the other way around. She should be dropping them off, and I should drive them back. You can see that she's the one responsible for all of this, yet she's ready to argue about the divorce terms. It's frustrating. My wife tried to convince me that she's remorseful and regrets what she's done. She told me she ended things with her affair partner, saw an exorcist, and confessed to the affair. She claimed she's left it all in God's hands. I laughed and told her I didn't care about her priest. She should confess to me. I gave her a chance to come clean and asked her how many times she had been close with him. She denied it, so I brought up the party she had with her work friends back in November and asked her why she rented an Airbnb for the night instead of staying at one of her friends' places. She went numb and couldn't find any words, except to ask me why I kept torturing myself with it. I explained that if she truly felt remorseful, she wouldn't keep lying, even two months after I left her. It was clear she wasn't being honest. I told her that, for me, intimacy over video chat is just as significant and I'm aware that she had been doing that with him. She couldn't even keep track of how many times she had done it with the AP. I then confronted her about how she envisions us getting back together, pointing out how she starts conversations with me, and then lies in the very next moment. I asked if she was aware that I would be checking her phone daily, and what she thought about that. She snapped back, saying, That's not trust. That's just treating me like garbage. At that moment, our son interrupted, and the conversation wrapped up. I added, don't forget, it's not just me you cheated on, but also our two beloved boys. That devastated her, and she started yelling that I'd better not say anything like that in front of our kids. It's funny 
Her sister spilled the beans about how my wife acts sad and cries every day because of the situation. She's two-faced, acting all sad with her family, but lying to me. She even said she could be with the affair partner and her family wouldn't care, as if I should be grateful she ended it with him and is now in control. Seriously? After some lawyer discussions, we've agreed on the divorce, and it will be finalized soon. She gets the unfinished house, and the mortgage is all on her now. I want to clarify that this isn't about revenge for her cheating. It's for the kids. Plus, I don't want to live in her small hometown, which is an hour away from the capital where I live now. I'm getting back what I invested in the house, and the amount is actually pretty good. Child support isn't bad either, and we've agreed that she will drop the kids off in the capital every other weekend. I just have to drive them back. Honestly, though, seeing my kids only on weekends hurts so much. I can barely handle it. I can't bear the thought of my one and three-year-old boys growing up without a father because of their mother. I wish I could have them with me, but Czech law doesn't allow it. I might have to start driving there midweek or find another way to make it work. As for her, she keeps saying she still loves me and wishes she could undo the past. She claims she suffers every day because of what she's done. She's softened to the point where she doesn't even mind if I check her phone anymore. It wouldn't make her feel bad. She's apologized to my parents and seems genuinely sorry. She's willing to do whatever it takes to make things right. Here's a shocker. Her affair partner got dumped. According to mutual friends, he has a family in Brussels and didn't want to risk getting caught in this mess. It was all just a game for him, playing with my wife. I'm moving on, not letting her toxic behavior drag me down. The divorce is happening and there's no going back. Good riddance to the cheater. I've got better things to focus on and a brighter future ahead. Life goes on and I'm not wasting more time looking back at the mess she created. Now, regarding signs of infidelity, how can you tell if your wife is cheating on you? Did her mood suddenly change? Or did she start going out more in the evenings? Did she express a desire to have fun with her friends or show any other unusual behavior? For me, let's just say I had a strong intuition. When I got home from work one day, she was on the phone. The moment I walked in, she hastily said, I have to go, he's home. Bye. And immediately hung up, looking at me innocently. That triggered a terrible suspicion in me. I considered asking her about the call, but she could have made up anything, like claiming she was chatting with a salesman about buying two massagers for the price of one for cellulite treatment. Such thoughts didn't just pop into my head. There must have been lingering doubt about my wife. I didn't like it, and I didn't want it to bother me every day. I'm not good with change, and prefer to avoid meddling in something that's already working fine to prevent making it worse. Let me introduce myself properly. My name is Ron, and Cindy and I have been married for 24 years. We have four children, two adults and two teenagers. We're not wealthy, but we make enough to live comfortably, and thankfully, we have no debts. Cindy and I own a cozy house with a paid-off mortgage. Our cars aren't new, but we don't have monthly payments. We might have a few small credit card debts, but that's about it. Overall, we're a typical American family trying to live within our means. On weekdays, we work, eat, and take care of our home. The younger kids go to school, and on weekends, we occasionally go out together. Cindy and I try to keep up with our kids' interests, whether it's sports, our classes, scouting, or other activities. Sometimes, we even have family dinners around a common table, a rarity in these times. Our love life is probably like most middle-aged couples. We make love once every two weeks or so. I might wish it were more frequent, but you know, it takes two to tango. Lately, Cindy hasn't been enthusiastic about that kind of closeness. That was a pawn, by the way, because of my so-called supernatural intuition. I feel like I have to be vigilant for any strange signs from her, as it seems I don't trust her without any apparent reason. I'm hoping this nagging feeling in my stomach is just indigestion and not a sign of what I suspect. My main problem is that I'm not a detective or an expert. I'm just an average, middle-aged man, unfamiliar with hidden cameras, phone tapping, computer hacking, and other spy techniques you might have heard of. Moreover, I'm not wealthy enough to hire a private investigator to follow my wife, especially when I don't know where to look or what to look for. Cindy manages our finances, so I have no idea about her payments. If I start going through paperwork, she'll notice and want to know why I'm buried in bills. What am I supposed to tell her? Honey, 
I've got a suspicious feeling in my stomach. Are you growing horns for me? Yeah, and she'd probably say, Honey, I bet you'd rather go for a break than deal with that. A bit of family background. Our marriage appears quite ordinary, as it should be at our stage in life. I met Cindy in our early 20s. We dated for about a year and then got married. Every two years, she had a baby, and when we reached four children, honestly, I got tired of babies popping out like moles in a slot machine. So, I had a vasectomy after her last birth. One night, all of us, our two teenagers, my wife and I, had dinner together. The kids talked about their school day, and Cindy shared details about her part-time job at the library. After our two youngest started college, Cindy got bored being home alone, so she got that part-time job at the local library. Her schedule was irregular, making me wonder if the library was a place I should check out. But how was I supposed to do that? Taking a day off work to watch who goes in and out of the library isn't practical. Forget the library. I had a better idea. I could catch her at her women's card club tonight and start my private investigation. After she left, I discreetly follow her in my trusty old pickup truck. I can't afford a rental car like husbands and stories about cheating wives. Anyway, Cindy left for the card club, and a few minutes later, I quietly slipped out. I knew where she was going since she had told me and left a phone number. Unfortunately, I lost her car, so I drove to Marg's house, where the poker tournament was supposed to happen. When I arrived, I saw Cindy's car among others parked in front of Marg's house. I waited, scanned the street, and got out of my pickup. I parked a couple of houses away, crept to a window, and peeked inside. There were four women at each of two card tables, chatting, smoking, and occasionally bursting into laughter. Just cards, money, and eight women having a good time, no debauchery. I was ready to intervene and put an end to what I assumed was wild behavior. But my investigation hit a snag. As I backed up to my truck, I stepped in dog poop. Great, I muttered, waddling sideways like a drunken crab with grease shoes toward my truck. Darn dogs and their owners, who let them roam freely after feeding them, leaving the rest of us to deal with unexpected landmines. I had to spend about 10 minutes cleaning the dog poop off my shoes before I could hop back into my truck. The stench lingered, so I rolled down all the windows, sped up, and made sure not to obstruct the inspector or risk a ticket for the foul-smelling environmental trail behind me. Despite the disastrous first attempt, I didn't give up. My gut feeling, like a reliable compass, insisted that betrayal was looming. Once home, after shedding my soiled clothes, I headed to the laundry basket to inspect my wife's undergarments. Luckily, she hadn't done laundry this week. I checked her closet for revealing dresses or inappropriate clothes, then went through every drawer in her dresser. Nothing suspicious. Absolutely nothing. In the office file cabinet, I found a binder of invoices and flipped through the bills until they blurred in front of my eyes, like lotto balls. I found nothing unusual, except for a hole in the bagel. Honestly, Cindy was a pro at hiding evidence of infidelity. She was impressive. Next, I accessed her computer using the password she had told me long ago, which was also printed out and hanging next to the computer. I scrolled through all of Cindy's emails, realizing it was a bit silly since we shared the same account. If there was anything fishy, I would have noticed it long ago. Not surprisingly, I couldn't find a thing. Another dead end. I have been searching for three hours and I had nothing against Cindy. When I read cheating stories online, there's always some evidence, secret phone records, motel bills, unexplained spending, and more. They hire super sneaky private investigators, install clever phone tapping devices, and catch cheating spouses red-handed. Yet where's all this stuff in my case? If I can't find a thing, my Cindy must be a master at covering her tracks and playing a double game. As I gave up and started cleaning my mess, Cindy walked in through the front door. Kneeling by the laundry basket, I held her dirty underwear. We both froze, her eyes widening like cat saucers. Cindy suggested it was time for a talk, accusing me of following her to Mark's. She described seeing my face behind the open window jam and hearing grunting in the darkness. She even mentioned the spot where Marg's dog did its dirty deeds. In response, I dismissed the idea of Marg having a dog, likening it to King Kong. I sat there with a silly smile, dirty clothes in hand, feeling trapped. My face and neck grew hot. My throat went dry, 
and I lost the gift of speech. I recapped recent events, expressing disbelief at finding Cindy sniffing my dirty laundry and questioning whether she didn't trust me. I mumbled about whether she truly believed I was cheating on her, stammering in my defense. Cindy suggested we talk and led me to the living room. Tossing the laundry in the hamper, I got up and followed her, landing on the couch. Cindy sat down next to me, folding her hands in her lap and looking at me intently. Shrewdly, she asked if I had been reading erotic stories again on my lunch break at work. Embarrassed, I nodded. She inquired if the stories I had been reading were about cheating wives, and I admitted they were. Cindy pressed further, asking if I thought of her when reading those stories. I mumbled in response, averting my gaze, and admitted that I did think of her. I tried to justify my actions by explaining that I followed her to Marge's because, upon returning home from work, I found her on the phone hastily saying, I've got to go, before hanging up. I went on the offensive, challenging her to explain her behavior. Cindy looked at me with raised eyebrows and a broad smile, shaking her head. She expressed uncertainty about whether to be mad at me or just hug me. Grinning, she mentioned that she didn't know where to direct her feelings. In response, I frowned and stared back, asking about the person she was talking to when I walked in and urging her not to lie to me. She casually shrugged, disclosing that she had been talking to my mother. Apparently, my mom called her almost every day and Cindy seemed amused by my big investigation being triggered by a call from her. She remarked on how foolish she felt for forgetting about my mom's tendency to call frequently, highlighting that my mom was yet another phone-happy individual. Cindy tilted her head, smiled slightly at my guilty conscience, and then moved closer, placing her hands on top of mine and squeezing them lightly. She inquired if I had ever found her behavior truly suspicious or distrusting. I admitted that it was just a gut feeling. Cindy continued to smile and affectionately called me a miracle, expressing her love for me despite my quirks. She wrapped her hands around my cheeks, declaring me her favorite man, and reassured me of her love. She acknowledged that we needed to improve our closeness and suggested we address it immediately. With those words, she took my hand and led me into the bedroom. She locked the door, dimmed the lights, and began undressing me. Cindy asked if I felt better now, with a playful glint in her eyes. I expressed my love and admiration, but still questioned the warning signals I had been getting from my gut. Cindy responded with laughter, holding her stomach and wiping away tears. She retrieved a blister pack of pills from the medicine cabinet and tossed it on the bed, seemingly finding the whole situation humorous. As I stared at the pills, frozen in place, my wife suggested that I take two for indigestion. She listened to the rumbling from my stomach and gave me a stern look, urging me to stop sniffing her dirty underwear. She found it disgusting, and I had to agree, when Cindy is right, she's right. 